Hi everyone, it's Kelly here. Welcome to my channel. If this is your first time, welcome back if you've been before. Lovely to have you either way. On this channel we talk books and today I am wrapping up my reading for the month of March. Uh, I am recording this on the 1st of April. Yes, I'm in my pyjamas. <laughs> I'm going to bed shortly. Um, I'm not wearing any makeup. I do have clean hair though, so I figured it was it was okay. <laughs> We're going for it anyway. I was in the mood to get this done, mainly because I've got a book due back at the library and I have to take it back tomorrow. So let's let's wrap this up and then we're we're good to go. <laughs> okay, let's um, talk the books that I read this month. So this was a pretty good reading month for me. I read seven books, which is my largest monthly total so far this year by one. <laughs> but still, that's still a good achievement. Um, so yeah, and I also was able to um, read a decent range of books this month, including um, two, three three books um, that are part of the um, Stella Prize long list, um, which is good because the shortlist is going to be announced on the 4th of April. So by the time you're seeing this, the shortlist will be out. Um, and also uh, I read one book from the Women's Prize for Nonfiction now shortlist because that has just been announced. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you all about them. Let's get into it. So first of all, a few books that are nothing to do with prizes, just ongoing projects that I have had. Um, so the first one that I finished, which is one that I've been reading for a very long time. Um, so I actually started this one in May last year and then popped it aside because I had um, some other reading projects and then it just took me a long time to get back to it. But I did get back to it and I finished it at the beginning of this month. Uh, and that is Femina by Janina Ramirez. A new history of the Middle Ages through the women written out of it. Um, so this was a really interesting book. Uh, I thought that it was... Um, enjoyable to read for the most part. I enjoyed learning about some characters from history that I wasn't aware of and um, or you know some that I only knew a little bit about so that was really interesting. There was a fair amount of speculation in this book um, in the sense that you know when you're looking at uh, you know it says the the women written out of it in the subtitle of this book and when you're looking at characters that are written out of history, the evidence that you have is quite scant. So you have to do a bit of speculating around it. And I felt that sometimes the balance was good and at other times there was a bit too much speculation. Um, and that is a theme that we're going to come back to at the end of this <laughs> uh, of this set of reviews. Um, so keep that in mind. But yeah, uh, I guess, you know, to some degree that is what had to happen, but uh, I think it takes a great deal of skill to get that balance right, and sometimes this book achieved it and sometimes it didn't. Um, so I gave, ended up giving this one three and a half stars. I would encourage you to read it um, to learn about some of these characters, at least have a look at the characters that are covered in it. Um, and I also appreciated that we did travel a little bit around Europe um, to some cultures that I knew less about. Uh, and then also, um, you know, we there was a fair amount that was sort of located in England and the UK generally. Um, but yeah, we did kind of go out and about a little bit around Europe to meet some other women as well. So yeah, highly recommended. It. it was really interesting. Three and a half stars from me. Okay, the next book that I read I don't have a physical copy of, and that is Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Uh, this I listened to on audiobook. Uh, it's a memoir that he wrote back in 2016, or published back in 2016, um, and I found this really fascinating. Uh, so he grew up in South Africa. Uh, Trevor Noah, of course, is the, I think he was the host of The Daily Show, I want to say, one of the evening funny news shows, you know the ones I'm talking about, um, and he is from South Africa, grew up there in a period where apartheid was, um, you know, in the early parts of his life was still a thing and then it was abolished um, and then sort of the aftermath of, of apartheid. But of course he is someone who has 
a European uh, father um, and a black South African mother. So his very existence was a crime at the time when he was born. So, um, you know, it was so interesting hearing him talk about, uh, you know, that, that part of his life where he was essentially in hiding, um, which must have been such a, an odd experience for him, especially growing up with cousins who didn't have mixed heritage and were able to kind of be out in the street and whatnot. Um, and he was not, um, because if he was discovered, then people could get into trouble. So, um, yeah, that was super, super fascinating. What a, what a horrible thing to happen, but, um, really well written. And of course he narrates the audiobook himself. So that was really interesting. Um, I had a lot of respect for him going into this, so I wasn't expecting to not feel respect for him, but I, my respect for him grew, um, as a result of reading this book. He, he had a really interesting, difficult life at times, um, and for him to be the person that he is now, uh, despite some of the difficult things that happened to him, um, was, is amazing. Um, you know, so there are quite a lot of, um, you know, things in this book that, uh, uh that happen, um, either to him or to people that he knows, including, of course, racism. That's not unexpected. Alcohol fueled domestic violence from his stepfather and poverty. Um, but yeah, he manages to retain hope and his sense of humor. Um, and I really recommend this one. It was four stars for me. Really, really good. Um, yeah. And the audiobook is a decent size, but not too long as well. So it was just under nine hours, which is a pretty, pretty good size for me for an audiobook. All right, moving on to one I do have a physical copy of. This is one of the ones that has to go back to the library. Um, and that is Eden by Jim Crais. Uh, this was also one that I listened to audio at the same time as looking at the text. Um, and the narrator of the audio was Ben Allen. Similar length, uh, just under nine hours as well in terms of the length of the audio book. Um, so this one is all about uh, the Garden of Eden, as you might imagine. And in the Garden of Eden live angels who have blue feathers. So that's what the blue feathers are on the cover. Um, there are also humans, or you assume that they're humans, who work in the garden um, and sort of like tend to the garden and have jobs that they have to do, labor. Um, the angels kind of run things. Uh, and we follow mostly a couple of characters. So we have um, one of the gardeners who's called Eben. Um, we have an angel who is has a broken wing because he has been too curious. He wanted to get out and have a look beyond the walls of the garden. Um, and he ended up getting injured. And so he's sort of like in the pecking order of the angels um, at the bottom, basically. Uh, and he's called Jamin. Um, at, and he and uh, so the two of them have this other character called Tabby um, who ends up uh, escaping the garden or we that is the assumption that she's escaped the garden um, and these two characters are kind of quite heartbroken about that situation because they were very close with her um, and they didn't know she was going to do that um, and so they're trying to work out what's happened and, and see if they, you know, see if they can remedy this situation. Um, and they are under increased scrutiny as well, because the, the way that things are run in the garden, um, of Eden is quite, uh, you know, oppressive. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was, uh, a book that was quite interesting to me in the sense of what happened to Tabby was that my interest in that propelled me through the sort of the initial parts of the book until we reconnected with Tabby again. Um, to be honest, I found Eben and Jamin quite insipid characters. Um, and there is another character, Alum, who is, um, he is also a human, but he's kind of a go between and he, He's a dibber dobber, um, so he is always kind of trying to get in good with the angels, and so he kind of tells on people for doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and he is kind of this go-between. So in a sense, he 
it doesn't really belong anywhere. He doesn't have community with the other humans because he's always like watching them and trying to catch them out doing the wrong thing. And then also the angels don't really respect him. They take his information, but they don't, they don't really respect him at all. So he doesn't really have a place um, to be, to be honest in, in, uh, in Eden. And he's also a quite um, a repulsive character. Although it was interesting to kind of, dig under the surface of him as a character and see his motivations. Um, so there was, um, they did use, or the, the author did use the miscommunication or misinterpretation of communication trope in this book, which is something that I don't really like. Um, so minus points there <laughs> from me. But this was otherwise quite an interesting book. I quite liked it. It was an interesting exploration of the... Um, you know, what it really means to, like, it, it explores religion, really, um, and also kind of explores um, uh, govern, government through fear and um, lack of information and keeping the population down um, and unintelligent so that you can get them to do what you want them to do. Um, so yeah, that it was really interesting in that way. I, I ended up giving this one 3.75 stars. So it was, it was good. I really, I really liked it. All right. Next one is the first one that I read for the Stella Prize long list. And that is The Hummingbird Effect by Kate Mildenhall. Um, this is a literary fiction, um, a little bit speculative because it jumps between a couple of different timelines. So we start in the 1930s with a character called Peggy. Um, and then we have Hilda in the 2020s um, and she's in a nursing home um, during lockdown. Um, and boy, was I not ready to read about that. <laughs> um, not enough time has passed. I had grandparents in nursing homes during lockdown. Um, and that was a really, this, this brought up <laughs> some, brought up some stuff for me, um, around that, like the, some of the fear that I felt at that time. Um, you know, the disconnection, like not being able to, to visit because, um, nursing homes were constantly being, you know, um, quarantined because, you know, um, COVID would get in and then everyone, everything would have to kind of lock down. Um, so you couldn't visit anymore, etc., etc. So, um, it was, yeah, that was intense. <laughs> that was intense. So if, if that was also your experience during COVID, if you had somebody in a nursing home, um, I would probably steer clear of this one cause it was, it was a lot. Um, anyway, so those two timelines. And then we also have another character, La, um, in the 2030s. So the sort of not too distant future. And then we have another character, Maz, in a more distant future, uh, following a societal collapse. Um, yeah, or collapse of the way of life as we know it now um, has occurred. And we don't really know exactly what happened we never really find that out um though there is a bit of speculation um by those characters uh in that future timeline that kind of gives us a few hints so i mostly enjoyed this book um i thought yeah again <laughs> it could have done without the reminder of the lockdown times that would have been probably could have been left out of this book and i would have enjoyed it a little bit more um i also wasn't sure if there was a i never because obviously when you read a book that has multiple timelines, you anticipate that they're all going to be connected in some way. And you do, um, this is a tiny bit of a spoiler, I guess. Um, you do get a connection between the 1930s and the 2020s timeline, and you get a connection between the 2030s and the distant future timeline. But you, I couldn't tell if there was a connection between the t Hilda in the 2020s and La in the, in the 2030s. Um, yeah, so that was a bit, or if they were just two distinct pairs, that was, confused me a little bit, I think, at the end, because I was kind of looking to see where that connection was going to happen and it, and it didn't come, but maybe I just didn't get it. Um, 
And I also think that more could have been made of the voice of the river because the voice of the um, this is all set in a, in the same place. So that is kind of the connection, the thread between all of the four timelines. Um, and there was a kind of um, they mentioned the the river that um, flows in the area where um, and sort of like the longevity in the, of the river and the kind of ongoing nature of the river. And I felt like more could have been made of that. That would have been a better connection between the four timelines and could have, like, I felt like that could have come to the fore a little bit more and that would have been a more cohesive book if that had happened. Um, I also just got a bit confused about what the Hummingbird Project was. So it, it, it was to do with sort of AI... Um, and like what could happen because of AI um, and you know how humans kind of it also kind of is touching on like drop shipping and um, you know those kind of like taboo and those kind of uh, websites where you you can get whatever you want Amazon things like that um, at you know, really quickly, so people are kind of, like, just ordering everything, you know, so, yeah, like, I, I, relatable, very relatable, and it was kind of a reflection on that to that lifestyle, and what that actually means for the environment, and, um, you know, as AI is employed more in these kind of endeavours, like, what could happen, so it was interesting that way, in that sort of speculation, but, um, yeah, so the, and the Hummingbird Project was related to the AI portion of that, but it wasn't ever really made completely clear what the Hummingbird Project was exactly, um, and the AI elements and what happened. So I kind of got, felt a bit lost. <laughs> um, and yeah, the thread that could have brought the, these timelines together just didn't quite work for me. And I think that if it had been the river that was the connecting thread, that would have worked better because it was touched on but it, if that had been more at the forefront um and more explicitly the connection between these four timelines then I think for me that would have worked better just a thought anyway I did still enjoy this book um it was enjoyable to read and I was interested throughout um so I gave it 3.75 stars um and yeah I would recommend reading it if the, any of those themes sound interesting to you but yeah with those caveats that I had um, as well. <laughs> All right, next one. This was another book. I do own a physical copy of this, but I've loaned it to my mum. She's about to go on a trip to Tasmania, and this book is set there. And also, I was um, thinking that it was something that she would probably really enjoy. So, um, this is Graft by Maggie McKellar. Again, this is for the, a book from the Stella Prize long list. I am hoping this one is going to make it to the short list. I really, really liked this one. Um, it's a memoir of a woman who works, um, she, with her partner, runs a sheep farm in Tasmania. And this is sort of um, a year, basically, uh, on that Tasmanian sheep farm during a period of drought. Uh, so obviously, drought impacts farmers pretty um, in a way that it is much more significant than it affects people living in cities, which is where I live. So it was an interesting perspective-taking exercise for me, just in terms of um, understanding what that looks like on a farm, especially an, a farm that uh, sustains animals. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. Also sort of the ins and outs of, of being a sheep farmer and kind of what jobs you have to do. Um, what that can look like, uh, some of the difficult things about that, um, as well as the sort of the triumphs of, of being a sheep farmer and, and achieving something in the work that you do. Um, so as well as it being a reflection on farm life, um, it's also really much more than that. So it's sort of also her reflections on life in general, um, life and death, on uh, nature, family relationships, on motherhood, and also identity, and especially identity uh, when you become a mother, like how things change for you 
um, when that happens. It was beautifully written. The, the writing was actually really stunning in this. And it would have been a five star read. I ended up giving it four and a half stars. But there was one thing um, I felt a little bit confronted about. Not a little bit. I felt a lot confronted about the way that she spoke about uh, her brother, who is profoundly disabled. She never explicitly said that he's autistic, but it was very strongly coded that he's autistic. Um, and she did talk about, she mentioned the word autism in relation to somebody else and then talked about her brother. So I, the implication and what I read into it is that he's autistic and it sounds like that he possibly also has um, a comorbid intellectual disability or something along those lines but she never explicitly said so and um, the way that she talked about growing up with her brother who by her account it did sound like it was a difficult um, time for her family because of some of the behaviors that he was exhibiting um, uh, which included things like smearing his feces on on things, which was confronting in and of itself, um, and and also sort of having these uh, extreme meltdown meltdowns and things like that. Um, so yeah, like I'm I'm not in any way uh, wanting to under undermine what she went through um, as the sister of a profoundly disabled um, child and now adult. However, um, I just, the thing that was confronting for me about it was this is not, this memoir was not about the brother. So he really only existed in the way that he impacted other people, his family, negatively. Um, which I felt um, diminished his human complexity. Um, and I don't know this person. Um, I don't know her. I don't know him. But just the way that she wrote about him in a real kind of like tangential way and not centering his story, it just didn't quite sit right for me. Um, and I'm still mulling it over, I guess. Um, I'm still undecided how I feel about the inclusion of that portion of the book. Um, because at no point in this year does she talk about going to visit him or anything like that. She's reflecting back on her childhood and about her parents and how life was for her growing up. So yeah. I'm still not 100% sure how I feel about it. So if that element hadn't been there, this would 100% have been a five-star read for me. Um, because as I said, it is beautifully written and the reflections are very deep and profound. Um, but yeah, this just, it just didn't quite sit right for me. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. But anyway, let's move on <laughs> to the next one, um, which is another book from the Stella Prize long list. And this is The Swift Dark Tide, another one that's got to go back to the library um, by Katia Ariel. This was a really interesting one. So this is, a, 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 again, a memoir. And this one is, an, the author is really plumbing the depths of her psyche <laughs> uh, in terms of reflection. Uh, in real time. So this was sort of based on a diary that she kept or writings that she did as she was going through the things that she's talking about in the book. So uh, at the beginning of the book, we find out that she has entered a lesbian relationship um, and is also lovingly, happily married to a man that she has had children with. Um, and he is the father of, of her three children. And it's sort of about her, I guess, um, her awakening to her sexuality um, and, and kind of really no holds barred uh, exploration of that sort of shift for her um, as sort of she attempts to kind of do t the two things in tandem and then kind of that doesn't necessarily play out the way she anticipated and she's reflecting on it the entire time um, to sort of think about the way that her 
thoughts and her behaviors and her choices are impacting the people around her. Um, so the writing in this book is again, absolutely stunning. It's poetic. Uh, it's very vulnerable and it's such a tricky topic to write about. Um, because she's very aware that she is causing pain to a person that she loves. Um, and also that, uh, in kind of pursuing her own truth and identity, she is also contributing to the a change in her family dynamic. Um, so yeah, it, kind of coming to this understanding of her own queerness in a situation where she still cares deeply about her heterosexual partner um, and sort of navigating that, um, which was, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and again, as I said, beautifully written. So I gave this on four and a half stars as well. Um, I'm very grateful to this book on page 15. Uh, it introduced me to an artwork, which I will put up on the screen, hopefully, if I'm allowed. Um, it's held in the, in the uh, collection of the Art Gallery of South Australia, and it's called Priestess of Delphi by John Collier. And I'm excited because it was this book introduced me to this artwork, which I'm, yeah, happy about. <laughs> so anyway, that was um, The Swift Dark Tide. Loved it. Um, I hope it makes the shortlist. Ha not having read the entire long list, but I'm hopeful about that one. It was really, really good. Okay, the last book that I read is um, one that is from the shortlist of the Women's Prize for Nonfiction, and that is All That She Carried by Tyre Miles. Um, this, again, as I said, is nonfiction, so it's a history book, and this one is about um, an artifact called Ashley Sack, and I'll put a picture of it up on the screen. Um, I believe that it's held in the collection of a small museum, but it was on display at the Smithsonian, is my understanding, which is sort of how it came to be more widely known about and, and viewed by lots of people. So, um, Tyre Miles does a really good job of tracing the life of this object and kind of, I guess, again, we're talking about speculation here because there is scant detail about the people who would have handled this item. Um, but essentially, uh, we've got, um, on the sack it says, uh, so it's, embroidered and it says my great grandmother Rose mother of Ashley gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina it held a tattered dress three handfuls of pecans and a, a, sorry peak I say pecans but because I was listening to the audiobook of this I'm wanting to say pecan because that's how the the audiobook reader said it that's not how I say it in Australia <laughs> pecans a braid of Rose's hair uh, told her, it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. So we find out about um, the, I guess, the provenance of this sack and the they looked into who the people were, um, who was Ashley, who was Rose, who was Ruth, um, and, you know, uh, how did this sack get where it was and so on. And I think... To me, that is the most interesting story of the sack, and it was what I was anticipating the book would be about. However, <laughs> um, and, and I would say it is also a very kind of layered story. So there's a lot going on in this book um, because she is doing a lot of speculating <laughs> around um, the people and what their lives would have been because we don't actually know we don't have many records about the existence of these people so she's looking at the historical record where she can but she's also speculating um, and using information from other people that lived at the time and were in similar circumstances to kind of try and I guess flesh it out um, so it was interesting but I would say the vast majority of this book was not actually about Ashley Sack. Um, the Sack was more of a springboard to talk about the history of enslaved people in mostly in South Carolina. Um, 
there was a lot of speculation, as I said, and there was a lot about other people. And it was conscious of the fact that it was doing it because it mentioned, the author mentioned, you know, the temptation to do these things and then just went on to do it, um, you know, to talk about other people that we do have more evidence about when you're trying to talk about these people. And I was more interested in their story. And if I had... Uh, it's not that the other parts of it weren't interesting, but it's not what I entered the book expecting to find because it was marketed from the cover, from the blurb, from everything that I've heard about it um, to be about this sack and my uh, the way that my brain extrapolated that was and the people who handled it and who are mentioned on it and who used it. Um, and kept it and so on and how it sort of came to be so that was the story I was expecting and then what I actually got was a history of enslaved people more generally um, in South Carolina which was also interesting but not what I was expecting in this book um, so yeah that was a shame uh, the other thing that I was thinking about because I'm thinking about this this is this is the second book from the long list that I have read. Um, I also read Wifedom by Anna Funda last year and it was a five star read for me. Now I, I was sort of drawing parallels and Wifedom was on the long list but didn't make the short list. This book did make the short list and I was thinking about that and thinking about how I thought Anna Funda did a much better job of the speculation portion uh, looking kind of between the the evidence that we have in history because they're both historical um, in nature. They're both looking at people who have been kind of erased from the record, much like um, Femina as well that I read at the beginning of the month or finished at the beginning of the month. Um, and I think, I think Anna Funder did a much better job of that because she did include speculation in there, but the way that she did it, um, it wasn't the, she got the balance right and so I'm thinking about these two books that were on the same long list and that this one is moving forward and that one isn't moving forward. And I'm unsure how that happened because I think it does, Wifedom, Anna Funder does a, an amazing job of bringing to life a person who lived, a real human who lived in history that we didn't know that much about um, taking the evidence that we do have, taking the evidence of the people around her, because we do know a lot more about George Orwell, um, as Wifedom is about uh, George Orwell's wife. So we do look at George Orwell and what was happening for him, and she's using what we know about what happened for George Orwell, but she never centres George Orwell in the story, um, and she's very conscious in the way that she does that. And I think that is the beauty of that book, um, is that it was it had that capacity to um, really kind of speculate in between um, in between the e the evidence that we do have about this person and bring her to life without overdoing the speculation and without centering other people. Um, and I don't think that this book managed to do that. So for me, um, it, while it was interesting and the story was interesting and I am glad I read it and I've learned about Ashley Sack um, and was able to draw parallels too to other books that I've read in the past. So I read a few years ago now, um, the Invention of Wings, I think it's called by Sue Monk Kid, which is around, uh, centered around uh, the Grimkeys, I think is the surname of the family and the people who worked for the Grimkeys, which is a novel. It's a novel, not a um, non fiction account. Um, but the Grimkeys are mentioned in this book uh, because it's sort of the same time period. Um, so, yeah great to be able to make those connections with other things that I've read and good to kind of reflect on what this book does well and what it doesn't quite achieve. Um, so I would recommend reading it. It's not too long, um, but I did give it three and a half stars rather than a higher rating because of that kind of 
those things that I've just mentioned, basically. <laughs> um, okay, so that was my reading for the month of March. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Um, let me know if you've read any of these books. I'd love to hear your thoughts about them, whether they agree with mine or don't. Um, down in the comments below, please feel free to chat with me down there. Um, and I will catch you on the next one. <laughs> Bye.